Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Joya Hampton Anderson, and I am the chair of the SSCP Diversity Committee. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this virtual clinical lunch. This event was originally a symposium scheduled to be, held, to be held at the Association for Psychological Science Conference, or APS, back in May. So I want to thank everyone involved today for their flexibility in making this a virtual event. I would also like to thank the SSCP board, Joanne Davila, Tom Olino, and Rosanna Bro, who were instrumental in reformatting this event. Before we jump in today, I want to make everyone aware of our diversity spotlight features that highlight scholars doing clinical science related to diversity issues. These features are on the SSCP website, which are that, um, that's listed on your screen. You can continue to follow our initiatives on our webpage, as well as on social media as shared by the SSCP Twitter account. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Derek Novacek, who is the Diversity Committee Research Chair and organizer of this event. Um, thank you, Dr. Hampton Anderson. Again, my name is Derek, uh, Derek Novacek, and I'm the Research Chair of the SSCP Diversity Committee. Um, the SSCP Diversity Committee is excited to host this virtual clinical lunch series highlighting diversity research in clinical science. Uh, we are fortunate to have three talented early career researchers with us to present their work, uh, which feels especially timely. Um, our presenters include uh, Dr. Lauren Kazem, uh, Dr. Craig Rodriguez Sejas, uh, and Dr. Natalie Watson Singleton. And we also are so lucky to have Dr. Rita, Rita Walker with us to lead our discussion. So our first presenter today is Dr. Lauren Kazem. Dr. Kazem is a postdoctoral fellow at the National Center for Veteran Studies at the University of Utah and will soon be continuing her fellowship at, at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Dr. Kazem is also chair-elect of the SSCP Diversity Committee. Her research is focused on identifying processes contributing to suicide, suicidal ideation, and, the, tra and tra the transition to suicide attempts in individuals with physical disabilities, veterans, and military personnel. Additionally, her research focuses on increasing the efficacy, accessibility, and research reach of interventions for suicide prevention and suicide risk assessment. The title of her presentation is Research Informed Considerations for Assessing Suicide Risk in Clients with Physical Disabilities. So I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Lauren. All right, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. All right, if we wanna go on to that next slide there. So when I talk about physical disabilities, I like to give a bit of an overview first when I'm talking about my work. So I like to note there are multiple conceptualizations of physical disabilities, but in my research, I focus on specific systems involving specifically vision, hearing, dexterity, and mobility particularly as over 114 million Americans live with some form of physical disability. And people with physical disabilities are actually the largest minority population in the US with over 20% of folks having some sort of disability. And disabilities can impact various systems, but I also note that they can um, impact what we call activities of daily living or ADLs, things like bathing, toileting, or feeding, as well as instrumental activities of daily living, or uh, IADLs. These include things like completing chores or using transportation. And so let's go ahead and keep moving. And there are some things that we know so far about physical disability and suicide, but ultimately our information that we have is pretty limited in this population. But what we do know is cause for concern. Particularly, these individuals are four times as likely to have attempted suicide within the past year. And as the number of physical disabilities an individual has increases, that risk or odds goes up to eight times. And in, according to the largest longitudinal study from the CDC, Americans with a disability are over 1.6 times likely to die by suicide or assaults than those without a disability. But there's still a largely um, a lot that's unknown about why a lot of um, this research is the case or why people die by suicide. 
who have physical disabilities. I do want to note, however, that even how suicide is seen in this population is considered acceptable among um, the general population at large, but also among individuals with disabilities themselves. So if we keep moving, I want to talk about what we don't know. So roughly half of people with physical disabilities are between the ages of 25 and 64, but our research is largely restricted to samples of older adults. So there's a large swath of the population that we're actually missing in our research and focused on physical disability. And in terms of research focused on suicide and disability, our research is a lot of times focused on whether like risk is absent or present, or if a diagnosis or ab is absent or present, but not necessarily what drives this risk in the first place. So this is really problematic, given that a lot of our suicide risk factors actually only predict suicide ideation and not necessarily a risk for suicide attempts. So we have limited theoretically driven research within what we call an ideation to action framework. Additionally, our research is based is focused on self-report measures, um, things like a presence or absence of a diagnosis, population level data, which can all be very informative, but it can be really difficult to identify the unique drivers of suicide risk in this population. And a really limited aspects of disabilities are considered. Things like um, severity of the disability, its visibility, and societal level influences. Thinking about things like discrimination or stigmatization, these are largely unexamined within this ideation to action framework of suicide risk. So in order for us to identify why suicidality occurs at such high rates in this population and to identify our best intervention practices, it's really crucial that these limitations be addressed in further research. So moving on, I wanted to share with you a theory um, that is based on the ideation action framework, just to get everyone on the same page. This is one of the leading theories of suicide related research in the ideation action framework called the interpersonal theory of suicide. And within the ITS, um, I want to note that suicidal ideation is most likely to come about or is, might be strongest when individuals experience two states. The first of which is called thwarted belongingness or an individual's beliefs of lacking close, meaningful relationships with other people. While that second state that I'll really focus on a lot today is perceived burdensomeness or an individual's beliefs about um, being a burden to others so much to the extent or to society at large, they believe that their death would benefit others more than if they continued living. In order to transition from thinking about suicide to making a suicide attempt though, an individual must possess a capability or a capacity for suicidal behavior. So for this to happen, an individual um, develops a fearlessness about death or pain tolerance towards bodily harm. And in the presence of both suicide ideation and the capability for suicide, that is when a more lethal or serious suicide attempt is most likely to develop here. So looking at this in people with physical disabilities, if we move to the next slide, a lot of my research has actually indicated that thwarted belongingness isn't as salient in this population. Actually, perceived burdensomeness is a driving factor. So it's possible that for those with physical disabilities, there may be a requirement of further assistance with activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living for these individuals where this might be more likely, the state might be more likely to develop. I want to note that in my research, I've found that these individuals with physical disabilities do endorse higher levels of perceived burdensomeness when compared to those without disabilities. And in addition, perceived burdensomeness has been indicated as a mediator in the relationship between disability or health related states and suicide ideation. So let's keep moving. So I wanna note that actually it's really unclear why perceived burdensomeness develops in the first place or what is the driver of this state. Research in people with physical disabilities hasn't really looked at why or how perceived burdensomeness develops and how that contributes to suicide risk. So we'll move on to the first study I'll present with y'all today. And I wanted to 
conduct this study because in addition to addressing the limitations of disability related research, another aim of my research was to examine if whether we account for all these suicide related correlates like perceived burdensomeness, sort of longiness, the acquired capability for suicide, depression, demographic factors, if physical disability was still associated with the history of suicide attempts when compared to a history of suicide ideation alone. If it, if it is, then this indicates um, some disability specific factors are important in the transition from ideation to action. So I'll give you a bit, a bit of a breakdown of the demographics of the study. We move on to the next slide here. So this was an MTurk study involving 374 individuals um, who completed the study online through MTurk. I want to note that there are some drawbacks to using MTurk. However, an online platform does increase accessibility, which is key in doing this type of research. So you'll see that the sample is predominantly white um, and it is a middle aged sample. What I also want to note here is that it's a pretty severe sample in that a third of individuals endorsed having a history of suicide attempts and a little over 25% endorsed having just a history of suicide ideation alone. So let's talk about a bit about the um, other breakdown of the sample in terms of disabilities and health conditions. If we can move on to the next slide. So we had 84 individuals with a physical disability with the most common being chronic pain, arthritis, blindness, or low vision. I also wanted to include health conditions here in this study um, as a variable um, because there's been some indication that health conditions may um, contribute to suicide ideation. So the most common in this sample, as you can see, were hypertension, obesity, and asthma respiratory problems. So let's talk about the results here on the next slide. So I conducted a series of multinomial logistic regression analyses. And with these results, I really want to highlight those, um, kind of comparing those with the history of suicide ideation, but no attempts, as a reference group to those with a history of suicide attempts. So you'll see when we account for all these different types of uh, correlates of suicide risk, and um, including things like depression and anxiety and health conditions, physical disability is associated with a 3.17 odds of um, having a suicide attempt history as opposed to having a suicide uh, history of suicide ideation alone. So what this means is even after accounting for all these other correlates of suicide, there's something about physical disability that may be impacting suicide risk. So if we keep moving along, what this might mean is that physical disabilities may uniquely influence suicide attempts alone um, of other health conditions or factors, but our, it's not necessarily the disability itself. It, there might be some drivers of suicide risk that involve the experience of having a disability that might be really key here. So what are the factors? So one of which I hypothesize is disability related stigma. So for those with physical disabilities, there's in, uh, increased psychological dis um, distress for those who experience stigma, lower levels of self-esteem, and things like discrimination, and particularly with those more visible disabilities. But these folks are actively avoided, which is, comes from the realm of a lot of social psych research. So if this is the case, then, the question is, um, if stigma is associated with like problematic mental health outcomes, does it explain how suicide related states develop, including perceived burdensomeness? Additionally, if we move on, I wanna focus on um, way we can advance suicide related research and assessment. So if we keep moving, we'll see that physical disability involves multiple facets. So I've talked about stigma, and I've talked about how the, dis the visibility of a disability may impact individuals' experiences. But let's also talk about the severity of it, too, if we keep moving. So we'll notice there's different facets that have really been largely unstudied. Things like physical independence. Can the individual complete activities of, of daily living? Cognitive independence, like making decisions. Mobility, getting from point A to point B with or without a mobility aid. Can the individual um, stay above the poverty line? Do they have economic self-sufficiency? 
are they involved in their community or with family or friends? Um, that can be you know, face-to-face -face communication or not. That can be working or even volunteering or um, spending time in enjoyable activities. These are really multifaceted um, pieces of disability that haven't really been examined as a whole, and particularly within an ideation to action sort of framework of suicide. So if we keep moving, this is a study I have um, that I've recently completed. I want to acknowledge my funding sources, the American Psychological Foundation and the Military Suicide Research Consortium for this, um, because it wouldn't have been possible without their help. But this is the first examination of suicidality in individuals with various physical disabilities within that ideation to action framework that includes these gold standard assessment measures of disability severity, assessing multiple domains and examining the role of perceived stigma and, vis and visibility of disabilities. So if we keep moving, I'll talk a little about what I expected to find here. So given the uh, results of my previous research and the findings that I've just discussed, I anticipated that stigma would indirectly prompt individuals self um, perceive a likelihood of a future suicide ideation as well as perceive likelihood of a future suicide attempt indirectly through perceived burdensomeness. Additionally, if we keep moving, I expected individuals, uh, their severity of their physical disabilities, which consist of those domains I've just spoken about, to moderate this relationship. So I conducted four moderation mediation, uh, moderated mediation models with simple slopes analyses to examine any significant effects through SPSS process. Additionally, I wanted to examine whether um, the disability visibility also impacted this relationship. Um, as a moderator. So let's talk about the demographics of this sample. So these were 127 individuals with uh, physical disabilities recruited from all across the US. Um, they either, either came into the lab in person or completed the um, research over the phone and with the internet connection. Again, we see it is a majority white sample here. Um, and I'll speak a little bit to that at the end. What I do wanna note is, it's, we have a nice age range here, which is a plus. And even though I didn't recruit for disability stat, I'm sorry, I didn't recruit for, I did recruit for disability status, but I didn't recruit, recruit specifically on the basis of suicide attempt or suicide ideation history. We see that 16% um, of folks endorsed having a history of suicide attempts and 30% had a history of suicide ideation alone, which is much greater than the general population. So if we keep going, in terms of the disability breakdown, we see that it is a largely um, a sample consisting of individuals with blindness or low vision, with the other um, very prominent or prevalent disability is related to mobility. So let's keep moving. So I wanna, I wanna point out here with our results that overall greater stigma was associated with greater perceived burdensomeness and the disability severity did appear to moderate this relationship. However, if we keep moving along, I do wanna note that the index of moderated mediation wasn't significant as it included that um, zero in that 95% confidence interval there. So it is a small sample with 127 adults. So because of this, um, I reran the analyses with five simulations of the data, but results were still consistent with um, these findings. So we'll talk a little bit about suicide attempts. We see that the same result happens there as well. And in terms of visibility of disabilities, they don't, it doesn't appear to moderate either that relationship between stigma and suicide ideation or stigma and suicide attempts through perceived burdensomeness. So if we keep moving, we can see that while there's an indirect effect through perceived burdensomeness, uh, perceived stigma on suicide related states through perceived burdensomeness, we can't really conclude that it's impacted by the severity of a disability or its visibility. So testing the type of disability or whether it was acquired or congenital actually as an interaction term, again, produced the same results I wanted to note there. So let's talk about implications then on the next slide. So given the severity may not be a salient, maybe it's possible that our interventions and assessment procedures can be employed in settings of various acuity. 
So our outpatient settings, our inpatient, and our rehabilitation settings where folks with physical disabilities are seen. And assessing individuals' perceptions of disability-related stigma or disability-related beliefs and perceived burdensomeness may be really particularly salient in providing indicators of suicide risk. So um, it's possible, you know, really that our targeted interventions may be really helpful regardless of disability type, severity, or, dis or visibility. So let's talk about responding to heightened suicide risk when it's present. What do we do? So I want to note that um, a particular intervention that might be accessible on our next slide here is called Caring Contacts, and it consists of sending brief, non-demanding well wishes to individuals at heightened risk of suicide. So it's been done in multiple modalities. So here's a um, form letter that could be sent from the clinic I work at here. Next will be um, an email version that was tested in 2014. And lastly, it will see a text message version here. And there's all, we're also in the middle of working on a video related version of Caring Contact. So it's cost and resource efficient, supported by the Joint Commission, and can be sent by through various modalities, which makes it more accessible to folks. And these messages are sent to increase the sense of connectedness um, to others, which might combat perceived burdensomeness and sort of belongingness. Moving along, we have other treatment options as well. So if folks are familiar with safety planning or crisis response planning, this can be adapted to meet our clients' needs. Um, I've done it with individuals who are blind or, blind or have low vision through recordings. Um, this can be done with use of brailers. Um, basically, the point is this can be personalized with use of a note card um, or even um, whatever works for the client. What we don't one is it to basically a client to be given a print off and then having to figure out how to make it accessible. Additionally, at Virtual Hope Box is a free smartphone app that allows individuals to import their safety plans, um, come up with coping mechanisms, and use strategies to help um, soothe themselves. It is uh, integrated with, or it can be integrated with the accessibility features, and it's available on the iPhone and Android. Lastly, Brief Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Suicide Prevention focuses on learning skills to reduce suicide risk and increase um, re individuals' reasons for living. What I really like about this intervention is one skill that is focused on it specifically is targeted, targeting cognitive distortions, if we want to use CBT terms. One in particular relates to perceived burdensomeness, as this is a common belief among folks who are at higher risk of suicide. So our next steps with these interventions include actively testing adaptations of them in individuals with phys various physical disabilities, and particularly among racial and ethnic minorities, as in disability research, um, it, these individuals and these populations have largely been understudied or not studied at all. So that would be moving on to developing these interventions further. So we'll go ahead and finish up here and thank you all so much for um, bearing with my technical difficulties and tuning in today. I appreciate it. All right, thank you Dr. Kazan for that very enlightening presentation. Thank you. Um, Thanks for doing a great job with the controls there. <laughs> Okay, let me just uh, go back here to. All right, our next presenter is Dr. Rodriguez Sejas. Dr. Rodriguez Sejas is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Methods to Improve Diagnostic Assessment and Services Program at Brown University. And he will be joining the University of Michigan as an assistant professor this fall. He is also the diversity chair at the Hierarchical Taxonomy of Psychopathology Consortium, also known as HITOP. Dr. Rodriguez Sejas's program of research explores how the structure of psychopathology and psychosocial stressors experienced by marginalized populations impact the assessment, conceptualization, and treatment of psychopathology. And the title of his presentation is Borderline Personality Disorder Diagnosis Among LGBTQ Plus Patients, A Question of Provider Bias. <laughs> 
um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Rodriguez Sejas, um, and you should be able to share your screen. So that's, thank you very much. Uh, let me turn this right. Are we all seeing my screen? All right, perfect. Uh, thanks for that great introduction, Eric. Uh, yeah, as I guess I'll just launch right into this. Um, maybe a little bit, a little background might be helpful. So a lot of my research and most of my clinical uh, practice, I suppose, has been mainly with sexual and gender minority individuals. And where I am in the Midas project right now, it's kind of housed in a larger partial hospital program. So a lot of this kind of came out of, you know, questions about the nature of our patients who come through the program, particularly the way in which we think about, diagnose, and then treat uh, sexual and gender minority individuals. So the one thing we think a lot about, and, and, and I think when everybody speaks about BPD or borderline personality disorder, we often think of it as a very severe form of psychopathology you know, that's host, uh, associated with a host of really deleterious uh, outcomes. So for example, individuals diagnosed with BPD usually show a wide range of comorbidities with other mood and anxiety disorders, types of internalizing psychopathology, as well as other disorders or problems, psychosocial problems that uh, reflect problems with impulsivity, disinhibition, or sensation seeking, so like our substance use disorders or more externalizing types of psychopathology. Uh, individuals with a BPD diagnosis is usually, uh, or having a, being diagnosed with BPD is usually associated with long-standing functional limitations across the lifespan, as well as not only problems for the individual with the diagnosis, but also a, a burdensomeness on caregivers and well-wishers and lo uh, loved ones of these individuals. When we think of the way in which we, the, the, the symptoms that we often see with these diagnoses, this diagnosis, uh, individuals with a diagnosis of BPD usually show higher rates of suicidal and non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, uh, difficulties particularly with emotion regulation, uh, problems with identity disturbance and identity development. Oftentimes it is associated with high levels of impulsivity or engagement in behaviors in an impulsive manner that could cause great harm or hold the potential for risk. And then interpersonal difficulties with others in their, in their worlds. And you can think of all these different characteristics as being smattered around the diagnostic criteria for BPD that we have in the DSM. So there are nine criteria, five of which necessary to a diagnosis of BPD. The piece that comes to me, I suppose, is a lot of the criteria or the symptoms that we use for the diagnosis of BPD, they bear striking resemblance to many of the psychosocial dysfunctional or psychosocial problems observed among sexual and gender minority individuals. So the example I think of, or the examples I can think of, are our first two criteria, so interpersonal instability, frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, can look very similar to the behavioral manifestations you might see of sensitivity to rejection. Um, to an extent, identity disturbance is somewhat normative among sexual and gender minority individuals, considering these are individuals who develop within a context of marginalization and stigma associated with their own identities. Um, LGBTQ plus populations show high levels of suicidal and non-self-injurious behavior as well. And we do know there's some literature showing higher levels of behaviors or engagement in behaviors among sexual and gender minority populations that could confer risk for other negative outcomes. So we can think of increased levels of substance use, uh, sexual and financial risk behavior. The slight key that comes to my mind is the way in which I've always thought of it, I think the way in which many people conceptualize psychopathology or psychosocial dysfunction among LGBTQ plus persons is really rooted in within minority stress processes. So you can think of it as this wider societal climate that consistently denigrates an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity is associated with these learning mechanisms that kind of perpetuate this un dysfunctional behavior. And you can think of it, this is just one example of the pathway by which this could take, where victimization, family rejection, exclusion, are associated with more expectations of rejection, depression, anxiety, substance use. And in this case, this example, uh, one behavior like a sexual risk behavior that could predispose persons to experiencing myriad forms of uh, other forms of, of dysfunction. So that being said, the question that came to mind, or the idea that came to mind was, well, given higher rates of psychosocial dysfunction observed among, yeah, right. among our sexual and gender minority populations, it would be understandable for individuals diagnosed with BP, to be diagnosed with BPD more frequently. And this would uh, mirror what some clinical research has shown. So some clinical settings or some literature documents higher rates of BPD diagnosis, or I should say not higher, high rates of BPD diagnosis 
among sexual and gender minority individuals in clinical settings. But there's a catch that comes to mind because there is a there are a few studies, or there's actually one and a couple bit of a, a little bit in the literature that suggests that the diagnosis of BPD among sexual and gender minority individuals might not always be reflective of actual psych presenting psychopathology, but might be indicative of maybe provider bias. So I'm going to talk on the left side. So there was one study, to my knowledge at least, that looked at this. And what they did was they presented case vignettes to clinicians. And can, vignettes are completely identical in terms of presenting pathology and a lot of the other information. But the only manipulated variable being sexual orientation of the patient or the potential patient, I should say. And what they found is when sexual orientation was made salient, clinicians were more likely to provide a BPD diagnosis to sexual, and sexual minority men compared with maybe a, a, a mood or anxiety disorder diagnosis. If you go to the right, there is quite a history, I should say, within the psychi psychiatry and clinical psychology literature of equating gender dysphoria and uh, gender nonconformity with borderline personality disorder itself. So that being said, the question then became for me was to systematically explore the extent to which differences in the rates of BPD diagnosis among sexual and gender minority individuals in our partial hospital setting reflected differences in underlying psychopathology, potentially provide a bias that's independent of pathology, or a confluence of the two, a mixture. And uh, so this is the result of kind of two studies. The first one having been about sexual and gender minority, sexual minority individuals, and I'm not finishing up the rest of the analyses for the gender minority folks. Uh, but we had a pretty large sample of heterosexual, cisgender, and gender minority as well as sexual minority individuals who presented to our partial hospital setting. Um, and this was data that was collected across the span of the last, uh, I should say, between uh, 2014 to 2018 or 2017, I think. I have to update and see where our data is right now. And this was for folks who provided, who one consented to the research, but also provided us information on all the measures that we used. So among these individuals, the BPD diagnosis and PTSD was provided either by informal clinician assessment or based on a structured clinical interview. So the SIDP for BPD, but then the SCID for PTSD. All patients in, 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 our, in our analyses completed the PID5DS from our adaptive personality traits, which I'm gonna to turn to in a little bit. And we included some correlates of BPD, some things that in the literature have already been associated with BPD previously. So age, gender where appropriate, and that's why we included PTSD. Particularly given the large disparity in our sample sizes. We really want to have a strong way of controlling for all forms of psychopathology that could be accounted or that could be systematic in differences across our groups. And we simply looked at using chi-square proportional difference testing and logistic regressions to figure out, okay, what's the likelihood or what are the differences in proportions of BPD diagnosis? Um, so, right, so let's talk a little bit about the PID-5. Uh, the PID-5 really and truly represents, it measures uh, five domains of maladaptive personality that uh, represent the maladaptive variance of normal personality function. And this is more consistent with the Section 3 uh, alternative model for personality disorders in the DSM-5. So it's a categorical dimensional hybrid. So instead of using nine criteria to diagnose um, any personality disorder, you really think about, well, what are the core maladaptive personality domains that are consistent with that disorder? In terms of BPD, and I'm not sure if my camera might be blocking it right now. Uh, right. BPD is really defined by a core feature of negative affectivity, as well as disinhibition and or antagonism. And that's the diagnostic features with it. So the kind of the idea that we were going with is well, actually, you can think of the nine criteria that we use for BPD diagnosis as kind of reflecting these different domains of maladaptive personality. And this is just my way of putting it together and making sense in my own mind. That, not really pulled from anything else. I just want an illustration here. So the approach I took is, if sexual and gender minority individuals demonstrate higher levels of maladaptive personality domains so on the top, on the top part, half of this figure, these bigger circles, then we would expect the differences to be different. We expect there to be differences in the diagnostic rates. However, if I statistically control for these maladaptive personality domains, thereby making them equal, and we, we should then find an equality in that there should be no significant difference across groups. If there is, if that still persists, it would be indicative of some form of bias that's independent of the actual presenting BPD psychopathology. Um, so what did we find? So if we're just on the top red uh, text for now, 
we did find for sexual and gender minority individuals, a higher proportion of persons were diagnosed with BPD. So we had 35% of our LGB persons were diagnosed with BPD compared to 18.2% of cisgender heterosexuals. For our trans and gender non-conforming individuals, that rises up to about 50%, just about 47% of persons received a diagnosis of BPD. Unsurprisingly, across um, our groups, having the diagnosis of BPD is associated with higher levels on all the PID-5 um, domains, so all levels of maladaptive personality. But what was important is even after controlling for that, and my camera I think is blocking still. Even after controlling for um, all these different clinical correlates of BPD that might be able to explain this, 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 this disparity, we still find a much higher likelihood, a significantly higher likelihood of being of sexual and gender minority persons, particularly our gender minority folks, being diagnosed with BPD at higher levels than cisgender heterosexual individuals. Uh, right, so sexual and gender minority individuals more likely to be given a diagnosis of BPD regardless of presenting psychopathology. Does this mean that clinicians demonstrate bias? I think that's really the question. That was the provoking question I did put in the title because I knew it's something we all think about. My answer is maybe, but not definitively. And that's kind of, this is where I think this begins to, begins to give me ideas about where I need to go next with this research. So when we statistically control for these maladaptive personality domains, these clinical correlates, we still find that our diagnostic rates are not equal across sexual and gender minority individuals and cisgender heterosexual individuals. But there's one thing, and the data I don't have is I didn't have access to criterion level data. I don't know if bias necessarily is reflective of differential item functioning in any kind of criterion that's individually used for the diagnosis of BPD. So the example I like to give, the, the way I think of it is, there is literature that shows that some sexual behavior like condomless anal sex among gay and bisexual men, in, tradition, in the way we measure BPD, that's often seen as an indicator of impulsivity. However, that's also for gay and bisexual men, oftentimes predicted by rejection sensitivity, problems with assertiveness, uh, social anxiety. So the question then becomes, well, is this indexing actual impulsivity? Are we getting at the same concept across these two groups? And I don't have the data, at least in this sample, to answer that. That's why I can't say, is it clinicians? Is it the measure? It might also just be clinicians have an inherent bias to provide a more severe diagnosis for sexual and gender minority individuals. But at this time, I can't answer that just yet. Nonetheless, the finding that sexual and gender minority individuals are more likely to be diagnosed with BPD, um, regardless of the presenting psychopathology, has important implications, the way I see it. Um, first off, it predisposes an already marginalized population to potentially experiencing further stigma from healthcare professionals. There's a, a quite a bit of literature that shows that uh, healthcare professionals use pejorative terms to describe BPD patients, so they consider them difficult, treatment resistant, manipulative, attention seeking. We also know that sexual and gender minority individuals are more likely to present for treatment. So a group that's more likely to prevent, present for treatment is also more likely to be diagnosed with a disorder that's associated, that's associated with extra stigma from healthcare providers. So that's one thing we think about. It also represents a potential barrier to accessing affirming care, especially for trans and gender non-conforming individuals. So this is, but in our standards of care for working with transgender, gender non-conforming individuals, BPD is specifically identified as one form of psychopathology that needs to really be taken into consideration before the provision of gender affirming care. So that already becomes another potential where sexual and gender minority individuals might be, just by, by virtue of this bias or by virtue of this predisposition to be diagnosed with BPD, might be reflective, might be more likely to receive suboptimal care. Um, you can think also if they're more likely to be uh, diagnosed with BPD, LGBTQ plus individuals are probably more likely to be routed to more intense treatments like DBT. And I think that's actually a Potentially, we all think that's a really good thing. They're going to get more intervention uh, assistance. The thing that comes to mind, and maybe something to think about as well going forward, is that the typical model of BPD in, in, in the literature and our, our conceptualizations is the biopsychosocial model. And I think it's important to think about where the relative emphasis is placed when thinking of this type of model. So, um, I throw up this little image here to, for two reasons, because I do like Calvin and Hobbes. I think we all, uh, we should all. Uh, but also because I think it's a good little quote. 
the, the extent to which a biological deterministic type of point of view is made about BPD could be, in my mind at least, perhaps a less empowering framework or way of conceptualizing BPD when working with sexual and gender minority folks. Because even if it's from a, from a standpoint of acceptance and, and acceptance, acceptance and, and working with, I guess, within that framework, it presents a narrative of, you know what, this is who you are as a person. Your biology is wired this way. Now let's work away, let's find a way of you know, figuring out life despite this. And it completely, uh, it ignores the wealth of information that points uh, psychosocial dysfunction among sexual and gender minority individuals at more environmental determinants, like uh, having to live chronically in a society where your sexual orientation and gender identity is marginalized, having to learn to develop ways of coping that maybe at this current stage in your life is not as effective, but have served to protect you throughout time. And changing the narrative to one of, well, if anybody was in this chronic marginalization or chronic uh, stigma, how could they not be expected to develop in this way? That being said, let's figure out how we can change things for the better. I think that's a bit more empowering, especially when dealing with a population who has been marginalized or who, who's more experienced, prone to experiencing marginalization throughout their life cycle. Another piece that comes up, and these are just all things that come to my mind when I think about these results, is the importance of cultural competence. So not being aware of unfamiliarity with the LGBTQ plus cultural context might lead to an inability to distinguish dysfunction from group-specific normativity or to be able to index certain behaviors in the actual core attribute that they're measuring. So being able to think of, is this impulsivity? Is this more anxiety? How am I going to think about those? Could lead to inappropriate diagnosis and then potential suboptimal care. And we talked about any specific criterion. The last thing I want to kind of end off it with is, well, what's in a diagnosis? What does it mean? Why do we care? We're talking about borderline personality disorder diagnosis. And there is why the literature that shows sexual and gender minority individuals have higher likelihood of, of being afflicted with several disorders, major mood and anxiety disorders, our substance use disorders, externalizing types of psychopathology, sexual risk behavior, so it paints a pretty grim picture of the mental health of sexual and gender minority individuals. Uh, the top left corner, you know, LGBTQ teens are six times more likely to experience symptoms of depression. The narrative then, as we study these and this kind of diagnosis specific approach, which fails to understand how all these different di disorders kind of come together and are related to one another within sexual and gender minorities, but also more widely, kind of propagates some, a grim picture about the status of sexual and gender minority individuals, but kind of serves to propagate a scientific stigma by virtue of calling this population out as afflicted by so many disorders. If we switch from this diagnosis-specific approach to approach an approach that instead, instead of saying that LGBTQ plus folks suffer from 10s, 20s, 30s disorders, to one of, you know what, in response to such environmental stigma, we find that LGBTQ plus folks are more likely to have elevations in few core domains of dysfunction. It's a little less stigmatizing in the science itself, but also in the way we think about it and would present this to our clients. So I put in the high top figure. Of course, this is consistent with the high top, the hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology, um, MO, I suppose. So pull up one of the high top figures. Right now, in, in, in the way I've done this research as well, I'm at the level of the gray boxes. I'm using all these different disorders and we're looking at, well, what is the likelihood of bulimia, of social anxiety, of MDD, of BPD? And we find higher rates across groups. If we go up a couple of levels instead, we change the narrative to being, you know what? Individuals who are sexual and gender minority individuals are more likely to experience internalizing psychopathology. That could manifest differently across persons. So it's more the core internalizing feature that's, I think, important going forward. And that's something else I wanna tie get into as, as we go later on, or stemming from this research, I should say. Right, so that brings me to the end of this presentation. I suppose I can't, this, this research would not have been helpful without, done without the, the help of, uh, and the support of Tracy, Morgan, and Mark Zimmerman, everybody at Brown, and our partial hospital personnel who, our, our patients and personnel who are really willing to participate in this research, who are uh, committed to also using the findings that we have to hopefully improve the partial loss as we go up as we move along. And I'm just going to end by if anybody who listens to this um, is interested in these sort of topics, 
here's my contact information. I'm always happy to chat this out, battle it out, have a couple arguments over coffee, something like that, or virtually over coffee these days. Whatever works. So thank you all very much. Uh, for, I mean, that's the end of, end of me. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez Sejas. All right. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Natalie Watson Singleton. And Dr. Watson Singleton, uh, you should be able to share your screen. <clears throat> um, Dr. Watson Singleton is a licensed clinical psychologist and assistant professor of psychology at Spelman College. She is also the diversity and inclusion education director with the NIA project at Emory University Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Dr. Watson Singleton's program of research includes understanding how stressful events such as trauma and cultural factors such as race-related stress influence African-Americans' health disparities, as well as how mind and body interventions can be culturally modified to reduce these adverse health outcomes. The title of her presentation is Development of Initial Testing of a Cultural Responsive Mobile Health, M-Health Application to Reduce Stress in African-Americans. And I'll turn it over you, to you, Dr. Washington. Thank you. I'm excited to um, be a part of this dynamic conversation. So my presentation today will focus on um, my larger program of study that is looking at how can we create culturally responsive mindfulness interventions for African Americans and how can we evaluate those, uh, evaluate and make those interventions accessible. So I'm primarily going to highlight two studies, uh, one qualitative and one quantitative. So this work is guided by the overarching goal to reduce African Americans. So African Americans experience health disparities across multiple adverse health outcomes both physical and psychological. We know that African Americans have elevated ra rates of heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, diabetes. And although the epidemiological uh, information regarding the prevalence of mental health concerns is mixed with some data suggesting Americans have higher rates of mental health symptoms, others suggesting that they have lower rates. What we do know is that for African Americans who do have mental health diagnoses, those symptoms tend to be more severe, more chronic, and less likely to be treated. I, and there are so many different things that we need to do to target African Americans' health disparities. And I recognize that mindfulness is one specific intervention that can be used at the individual level. Um, so mindfulness is, is a, an effective behavioral health strategy that has been found to be effective for a host of symptoms, both physical and psychological. We see that mindfulness reduces weight, reduces blood sugar, reduces blood pressure. A lot of the mechanisms that are implicated in the various health disparities that African Americans experience. And at the same time, we know that mindfulness has a diversity problem. And one of the things that I wanna mention here is that when I'm talking about mindfulness, I'm specifically talking about the white-centric mindfulness curricula offered in the US. And mindfulness, so this study specifically, the MBSR stands for Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which is a widely offered eight-week mindfulness curriculum that's offered in the U.S., a recent study looked at how many articles actually included communities of color. And what they found is that of the 69 articles that specifically looked at MBSR, only 11% included African Americans, 4% including Latinx populations, less than 1% including Native Americans, and 4% for Asian American. This study specifically said, well, let's not just look at MBSR. Let's look at mindfulness citations generally. 
And for those of you all in the field, you know that mindfulness has become increasingly popular with more and more studies popping up, looking at the effectiveness of mindfulness. And DeLuca and colleagues actually found over 12,000 citations on mindfulness in the U.S. between 1990 and 2016. And what they found is that of those 12,000 plus, only 20 24 included a diversity focused application and what they identified as diversity focus it means that they had a comparable sample of African Americans or racial ethnic minorities and only three specifically tailored the intervention or adapted the inter intervention to meet the needs of racial ethnic minorities and of these three two of them the cultural adaption was simply offering the intervention in Spanish. So not uh, tailoring the content of the intervention, but offering it in a different language. And this is a concern. If we see that African Americans have these health disparities and mindfulness is a useful strategy that can be used to reduce these health disparities, why aren't they being included in the interventions and studies? And specifically, if we want to increase engagement among African Americans in mindfulness-based interventions, one of the things that we know to be true is that African Americans underutilize, significantly underutilize mental health services or behavioral health services but are more likely to request and participate in culturally tailored interventions. And this is important because also when people receive their preferred treatment, they're more likely to attend treatment and more likely to experience improvement. This is important, again, too, not only to increase engagement in behavioral health interventions among African Americans, but also to ensure that once they engage, they are staying retained in the intervention. So there are two primary barriers or two crucial barriers that hinder the dissemination of mind mindfulness in African American communities or that uh, hinder African Americans engagement in mindfulness-based interventions, and one of those is the limited availability of culturally responsive mindfulness and the inadequate access to such. So we need to first create the content, and then we need to make sure that African Americans can access it. So to target this first uh, barrier. I'm going to be talking about a qualitative study that I did with my colleagues, Dr. Angela Rose Black and Brianna Spivey. The guiding framework for this study was Briggs's mental health utilization logic model. So according to Briggs, if we want to reduce health disparities, we need to increase folks engagement in interventions that can decrease those disparities. And in order to increase engagement, we have to target factors inside the intervention, factors outside the intervention, and individual level factors. Factors inside the intervention include things like the content, so the language, the terminology used, the images used to promote uh, the content, Factors outside the intervention include things like the cost of the intervention or even where the intervention is located and individual factors or again anything sort of uh, intrapersonal that might either increase or decrease engagement. So for this study, we were specifically interested in asking, well, what modifications to internal factors, external factors need to happen to increase engagement in mindfulness interventions for African Americans, and what adaptions, adaptations can reduce individual level barriers to improve engagement among African Americans. And for this study, we specifically focused on African American women. So this study was conducted in Madison, Wisconsin, and women were invited to participate in a focus group following a four-week MBSR intervention. The intervention was not culturally tailored 
we wanted to offer the intervention as is because I think the question of whether it needs to be culturally responsive could be argued to be an empirical question. So we wanted to say, okay, well, if we offer the intervention as is, do African American women see an issue with it? Or is it fine as is, or what adaptations would need to happen? And so again, we did not alter the intervention in any way other than to take the eight-week intervention and reduce it to a four-week intervention. And we did that in consultation with two certified MBSR instructors. And the other thing that we felt strongly about is that the facilitator needed to be African American. So although we did not edit the content, we did intentionally decide to make the facilitator an African American woman. So the cohort included seven women between the ages of 38 and 65 all of whom had children, 80% who were college educated, one out of seven were never married, and one out of seven were unemployed. Women were recruited from uh, Madison, Wisconsin at the Black Women Wellness event, which is the largest event for Black women in Madison. And again, all seven women participated in the intervention for four weeks. At the end of the four weeks, women were asked to participate in a focus group that was an hour and a half, as well as to participate in one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews. The questions of the focus group included things like, are there any practices that we learned that you could see helpful for some aspect of your life? Uh, in what ways do the skills that you learned in the four-week series in what ways would they not work or fit within your families and communities? And if you were in charge of running this mindfulness series for African Americans, how might you change it? For the sake of time, I'm not going to go into sort of qualitative quotes, but to summarize, women identified modifications that had to happen across the internal, external, and individual uh, levels. For the internal modifications, women emphatically said that the facilitator needed to be African American. They did not have a preference for gender identity, but they did say that the facilitator needed to be African American. There were certain things that only African American facilitators could understand. And they felt like having an African American facilitator would reduce concerns around cultural mistrust, and it would communicate that this intervention had been designed specifically for them. Women also felt that the intervention need to, needed to explicitly identify and name meaningful cultural values, things like self-empowerment, things like resilience, things like determination, things like interdependence and community. They also felt like the terminology used needed to be culturally familiar. So women expressed issues with the term meditation, specifically if meditation was be, being used in a non-religious or a non-church context. They also took issue with terms like, you know, call up in your mind's eye. Women were like, I don't know what a mind's eye is. So you need to stick with terminology that's familiar. And they also emphasized the importance of culturally tailored resources. And this was most salient with the guided meditation uh, CD that they were sent home with. So true to MBSR, participants are sent home with guided practices to use throughout the week. And women talked about the first time they put the CD on being shocked that the voice was a white voice, what they perceived as a white voice. And they were like, the last thing we want to hear at the end of the day is a white person telling me to relax and to close my eyes. I've gone through sort of the stress of my day, the stress of my life. It's not stressful to listen to another white person tell me what to do. And said that they would have an easier time engaging in the practices if the voices sounded like their voices. They 
also highlighted that it was important for the intervention to be offered in community sanctioned locations. So things like churches in their community, community centers in their community, a boys and girls club. They said, you know, the locations that we already frequent as opposed to sort of situating it within a primary care clinic, within a hospital, put the intervention in places where we already go. And women felt like in order to increase engagement in the mindfulness intervention, we needed to address religious concerns. So women talked about concerns that mindfulness might be going against their religion, so that there needed to be some psychoeducation about whether mindfulness was or was not a spiritual practice, and in what ways it conflicted or not with their religious practice. They also said that the benefits needed to be accentuated. So basically tell me why engaging in this practice is helpful. And they felt like it was extremely important to underscore holistic health. They felt that if we tailor or sort of um, advertise mindfulness as an intervention to target target mental health symptoms, that that might be stigmatizing, that people would be less likely to engage in an intervention for psychological concerns, but might be more open to engage in something that was going to reduce stress broadly or help them with their blood pressure. So once we have this culturally responsive intervention, or once we take uh, folks's qualitative data and turn it into a culturally responsive uh, mindfulness intervention or create mind, culturally responsive mindfulness content, how do we make sure that the content is accessible? Well, one way to do this is thinking about the utility of technological approaches, things like online interventions or mobile health apps. And there's been growing attention on technology-based interventions because they seem to address a lot of the barriers that disproportionately affect marginalized communities. For one, technological interventions tend to be low cost. So there's a lot of free apps or apps that do cost maybe $1.99, $10.99 a month, as opposed to paying sort of an hourly rate for a therapist or needing sort of extensive insurance coverage. Also, technology-based uh, interventions tend to be widely available and easy to use. One of the questions that I often get in doing this work is, well, how does this apply to African Americans if we think about the accessibility barriers. There is research to, to suggest that a majority of African Americans do own a smartphone and do or are interested in using health-related apps, and even more so if those health-related apps are culturally responsive. So with funding from NIH, my colleagues and I received the uh, funding through NIH's SBIR, the Small Business Innovation Research uh, Mechanism, to create a pilot mindfulness app for African Americans. The app is called Mindful You, and how the SBIR mechanism works is that you can get funding across three phases. So phase one, was just to develop a pilot app and to assess its initial effectiveness. And so this is a visual of what the app looks like. The app included, I believe, uh, the pilot app included eight meditations. All of the meditations were offered by African-American voice actors. They were created by uh, African-American mindfulness practitioners and scholars. And the image that you see is also an example of our recruitment materials. And one of the things too that we learned from the qualitative data is to, again, sort of like downplay the language of mindfulness or meditation. So even the phrasing on the flyer is looking for your happy place. Again, making that language accessible. 
And so for this study, or in testing the initial development of the app, we used a within subjects pre-post design over a two-week intervention. So we recruited participants to use the app for two weeks, and we were interested in if participants who use the app would experience less stress from pre to post, would they evidence better emotion regulation, and would they actually use mindfulness more often? So to assess these uh, questions, we use the perceived stress scale, which is a 10 item uh, stress measure. We used uh, the DARS, the difficulty and emotion regulation scale, which is a 36 item. Higher scores actually uh, suggest more difficulty in emotion regulation. And then we use the mindfulness behavior usage scale. There were other um, measures that we administered and other constructs that we looked at, but again, for the sake of time, really wanting to focus on sort of stress, emotion regulation, and behavior change. So this study included 39 participants. One of the things that I wanted to know is that we actually recruited 71 participants into the intervention. However, only 39 people actually used the program and completed all measures. So there were 32 who either didn't use the app or who used the app but didn't complete theirs. We did look at differences and there were no significant differences between those who used the app and completed the measures versus those who did not. The mean age was 31. Most of the participants were women. Most had heard about mindfulness. Most were employed and most were single. The average time listening to the guided practices was 39 minutes. So this is not 39 minutes in a single setting, but 39 minutes across the two weeks. So this average is about two to three minutes a day, but probably what was happening is that people were probably using it a couple days a week for longer periods of time. Average listening time did not significantly predict change on any of the health specific or mindfulness related measures. And we were particularly interested in this because there have been a lot of questions regarding how often or how much mindfulness do I need to do to see the positive difference. And so from our evaluation, what we saw is that that our hypotheses were supported. So individuals from pre to post, individuals reported less stress. They reported increased mindfulness behavior, so using mindfulness more, and reported reductions in emotion regulation difficulties. So where do we go from here? The next step, we recently received funding for phase two. Phase two is to take the pilot app and develop a full functioning app and to test its efficacy using a randomized uh, control trial with 160 African-American participants over a 12-week period. So again, we'll be looking at stress, we'll be looking at things like emotion regulation as well as other constructs, but really assessing whether this change um, is due to the effectiveness of the intervention compared to a waitlist control. And so I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Dr. Angela Rose Black and Brianna Spivey, who participated in the qualitative data, as well as Trifola, which is the tech development company that is my co-PI for the NIH-funded grant research. Thank you, doc, Dr. Watson Singleton. All right, I'm gonna switch us to gallery view here for, <clears throat> for the discussion portion. So I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Rita Walker to lead our discussion. Dr. Walker is a licensed clinical psychologist, uh, professor of psychology at the University of Houston and a fellow in the American Psychological Association. She has published more than 50 scientific papers on psychological risk and resilience in African-American mental health. And she recently published a book 
um, that is called The Unapologetic Guide to Black Mental Health. Um, thank you, Dr. Walker, for joining us today um, and for leading our discussion. And I'll turn it over to you um, to start us off. You're muted, Dr. Walker. And you know, I told myself I wasn't going to do that. I was ready to go. Uh, thank you so much for the, for the introduction. Uh, I'm grateful to you and, and uh, also for the diversity committee for coordinating this really important conversation. I don't think that you all knew how timely this would have been when you organized this, this panel. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I really appreciate that and I'm grateful to be here. And one thing that I want to, uh, to comment on explicitly is just, you know, you all know because you're here that when it comes to some of the people or segments of our community who are most troubled, those are also the segments of the community who are least likely to get help. And it's, it's, it's sad and it's disconcerting in so many different ways when we know that a lot of the challenges aren't brand new, um, but that they are really very, very persistent. And so what I appreciate about the collective of presentations today is that you know, it's going beyond just looking at the superficial, okay, here are challenges and let's just describe the challenges, but really digging in and trying to look at the different layers. And so as an example, Dr. Kazem, you know, not just that there is a physical disability, but what is it about the physical disability that leads to a number of different, you know, so, so psychiatric crisis, really thinking about suicide versus also developing a plan and having a suicide attempt. And, and what is that? And I can relate to the challenges of that work because I've, I've been up to it for a while now and recognizing that even when we are very clear, you know, those who are in the community and who are really invested in the community, not just professionally, but personally, you know, that there, there is easy, not easy, but you know, there is some, some work that can be done that's, that's pretty accessible if we can say that were it not for this, the context, so the systems that are in place that undermine um, or, or reinforce or affirm the need for the work. Um, and so I, I'm going to say a little bit more about that, but I also still just want to, to acknowledge, you know, even with Dr. Rodriguez Seha's work and recognizing for both sexual and gender minority individuals, you know, the challenge of misdiagnosis and how that's potentially baked into the system with respect to bias on behalf of the provider and how um, unfortunate it is that we're still having that conversation in 2020. And how long have the guidelines been available for providers to just do better? <laughs> you know, just let's all just to, to do better. Um, and also, and, and so Dr. Watson Singleton, I want you to know that I, I wanna have access to the app um, when it comes available, uh, please and thank you. What's fascinating about that population is recognizing in your, um, in the, the focus groups, this is a relatively educated population, right? And so oftentimes we think of individuals who have more means that they're doing better, but we still see problems with health concerns, like serious health concerns and mortality in educated, relatively high functioning populations. And so in that group, consistent with all three, we have a challenge of, of accessibility and being able to get the work that is both meaningful, um, and I, I'm really fascinated by the idea that, you know, we need someone who both sounds, we need them to sound the way we need them to sound um, and to say what, what speaks to the, to the group. And the notion, again, that, that we're still having these conversations, and you all know. Um, so one of the things that I, I think it would be nice and helpful to kind of flesh things out a bit for our audience when they hear your wonderful presentations, you know, is talking more about the challenges that you experienced in doing this work. Whether there are, uh, you know, reviewers who say, I don't know why you would ask these questions. Um, or whether they would be methodological challenges as, a, as an example with regard to, to recruitment. I really appreciated um, Dr. Kazem saying that while MTurk may not be ideal, it allows us to be able, or allowed you to be able to circumvent accessibility. So if you all could just say a little bit, I, I know that you, two of you have your mute already 
off because you anticipated you did better than I did. Um, that if you could just address that, that question, and then maybe we can start to get into some of the, the audience submitted questions and we can have time for that. Dr. Cosm, if you want to start us off and then, okay. Sure, absolutely. So you're right that um, accessibility is a huge concern um, in my research in particular. Um, and just when we think about um, maybe even in the clinical realm, if folks can't get to the therapy room, of course they're not going to receive treatment. And it's similar in research as well. I started off wanting this perfect in-lab study, you know, to publish in the high impact journal so everyone can see this work because, you know, I was so excited about it. But as my participants just were trickling in at best, I realized I was doing something wrong. Something's missing. And it turns out that once I increased the accessibility of my study by allowing folks to participate remotely um, and just kind of conceptualize the study from that point of view, it turns out that, you know, I was able to get, you know, probably a much more diverse sample um, in terms of types of disability, in terms of people's like cultural backgrounds, employment, et cetera, than I would have gotten in an in-lab study. And I think it's not necessarily that people with disabilities don't exist because the research would almost indicate that since there's not much, or hardly any research focused on disability and suicide, it's that we aren't actually creating accessible research. A lot of my um, participants know we're actually excited about this work, um, which was a motivating factor for me to keep going. Um, but I think it just highlights how crucial keeping your work accessible. Um, that also includes sharing your results at the end so that folks, you know, can also, you know, they want to see, you know, what, what happens after I participate in the study. Keeping accessibility in mind throughout the whole process is the biggest thing um, I would really keep in mind moving forward with this work. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I could kind of speak to another end of this entire spectrum. Um, in, in the study, these two studies I presented, they were parts of larger studies, so you know, participants. It was kind of more just passive collection of this data. That being said, it was kind of the presentation. I'm fully aware that my suggestion is that clinicians might be biased, and in the review process, I was met with criticism, and I can specifically recall the sarcasm from reviewers before that I would suggest the heinous crime of bias. Like that stood out to me, and I thought, well, this is just what the data says. It's not a terrible thing. We all have biases. This is the importance of becoming aware of that and and potential. Now it's you know the the the, the sexual minority papers that are currently under re-review. And I think that there are a lot of strengths and edits we made and additional analyses that were helpful. But it is also coming up with people you know feeling kind of slighted that you would suggest that this needs to be tailored to a population or to suggest that something specialized needs to be done. And I suppose I was fortunate in my own graduate training to have worked with mentors who were specifically working on tailoring interventions for sexual, mainly, mainly sexual minority individuals, but having that specific training, which isn't, uh, I suppose, the norm in most places. So this was just a, a mindset that I was used to. So yeah, it's, it's coming, that, that's one piece of the kind of getting the, the dissemination of the results is that, well, sometimes you're going against what other people expect and Sometimes when you call things out, people don't like it, or they're not comfortable at least with it. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I would say that there's um, sort of two key uh, challenges in doing this work. I think one is the um, ways in which qualitative research is, like the value of qualitative research is minimized. Um, and yet sort of the value of qualitative research when you are bringing attention to topics that have largely been understudied in the literature before we can create culturally responsive content we need to ask the communities what what is it that you would want from such content as opposed to assuming that we know what's best and I think in using um, qualitative methods there's a way in which people have used that to uh, sort of discredit the work. So, oh, you know, you have a study that 
at seven people or 20 people or 40 people, that's not generalizable. So therefore we are not going to sort of accept or agree that mindfulness in its current form uh, is insufficient for communities of color. So I think that that's one challenge. The second challenge, I think, as a health disparities researcher who operates from an intersectionality lens, how can I create an app that has content that meets the needs of African Americans and not treat African Americans like a monolith? To recognize the within group variability, the meaningful within group variability that exists within our communities. Um, so that has been something that I have grappled with even in creating uh, the content for the app. Yeah, wow, that's, you know, I, I applaud each one of you because I know that you have to put your heart and soul and then some into doing, into doing this work. So, you know, we didn't get to do applause earlier, but you know, this is my applause here for, <laughs> for, for each of you and the work that you're doing. So with that, can we go ahead and, and start with the questions? I see Dr. Hampton Anderson nodding yes, yes. Yes, absolutely. So we have um, questions from Twitter that have been coming in this week. And the first um, we have for Dr. Watson Singleton. Um, uh, the question was, how do you plan to introduce this mobile app to younger patients and those who may not have access to the internet? So I think make, so I'm not sure what was meant by younger, but often if we think about sort of the research of who's most likely to engage in health apps, it's people between the ages of 18 and 39. So I think part of the question is, how do we have folks over 39 engage with the app? Um, now, I think if the question, if it's about adolescence, I think that that is a, a useful question. Um, and one that I think me and my colleagues will sort of continue to think about as we take into account the meaningful within group uh, differences and variability that exists within African American communities. The question about internet access, I think, is also a good one because even though um, uh, most people nowadays have smartphones, right, um, it's still that question of access. And even though technological interventions are more accessible than I think our traditional uh, interventions, there is still that question of how do we uh, um, make these resources most available to the folks who need them need, need them most. And so I don't have a good answer for what do we do for people without uh, internet access. I think it, we're continuing to still work it out. Absolutely. I feel like we've all been working it out in the age of COVID, <laughs> right? I feel like we've thought about these questions more this year, um, and I'm hopeful that that moves towards more meaningful change in that area. Great, thank you, um, Dr. Watson Singleton. Um, our next question, so we have one for Dr. Rodriguez Seha. So how should medical professionals and doctors go about um, encountering a patient um, with a background from your study? Yeah, so I think the one thing that's really jumps out to me is competence. And I mean, that's part of the, the, in the, in the standards of care. It's all about being able to appreciate competence. And that's an active process that people have to go through on their own. You have to be committed to this. You have to find the resources. I can give an example. One brilliant resource, is, and I'd actually respond to that person on Twitter, is this, oh, this okay. handbook that's really well done by, and edited by John Pachankas and Steve Safran. And there is a specific chapter in here. And let me just get the author's names right, because I don't want to say something rude. But specifically about DBT, and, they, and I, I, I enjoyed that chapter because it really talked a lot, a lot of the stuff I was thinking about, about how it could be edited or things to think about when working with sexual and gender minority individuals. It's written by David Pantaloo and Colleen Sloan and Adam Carmel. And there are a lot of different resources um, that one can find. This was just the one that I'm more familiar with. Uh, I contributed it to it. But there are other resources that I found about, actually I found, uh, I haven't gone through it personally, but I have it now, uh, mindfulness modifications for sexual and gender minority individuals. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of literature on this topic. So it's kind of going out of your way to find it, to make yourself aware of it and make sure that you're open to potentially discussing it at the same time kind of walking that balance of not pushing it onto any individual client but somehow conveying that i'm open to being to discussing these should they come up i'm knowledgeable at least competent or i can display a level of cultural humility where i'm okay to learn from you 
and then letting them kind of lead that show at least. So like in working with patients, you know, oftentimes we use this minority stress framework and there are those who are like, oh, that doesn't apply to my life. And I'm like, cool. It stays in the back of my mind. It stays into how I think about things that could come up, but I'm not going to force them. If this is now you're going to work with me, cool. It's just, it'll just present like a, a, a kind of rupture in our relationship anyway, if I try to force it down your throat. So it, the onus is really on the providers to make sure they're aware and continually aware. And if they're not, being able to admit that and say, you know what, I can't have, I should not be the person working with this client. Let me direct them to somewhere that's much more appropriate for them. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. All we're always being willing to always do to work, do the work and yeah. understand that learning about our patients and the work that we do is an ongoing process and does that end. Thank you, Craig. Um, all right. Let's see. So we have, uh, um, there's a so, question. Oh, um, for, for Dr. Kazem um, about how to consider age um, when assessing and treating individuals with physical disabilities. And if you can speak to any research you've come across or in your experiences with kind of how age impacts um, suicide risk among uh, individuals with physical disabilities. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in terms of age, so I've mentioned before that a lot of our research is focused on older adults. Um, in terms of looking at suicide risk, um, because there is a you know correlation between age and kind of more health issues, so I think our the research base kind of reflects that, and there is an increased risk certainly among this population. Um, but I really not my research is not indicating that age is as significant as a factor. If we look at age in more an age in terms of across the lifespan. And this even kind of relates to how people respond to treatment too. So if we think of like our suicide focused treatments or even just our treatments in general, we find that older adults do respond as well as younger adults. They might just take a little longer to respond, but outcomes are still the same there. So I would say that our, you know, our treatments, I think, can be helpful for older adults and our suicide risk assessments can be helpful for older adults as well, particularly those with physical disabilities. Again, just keeping in mind that as we've spoken to other groups, um, aren't necessarily, you know, specific groups aren't necessarily monoliths, right? There's so much heterogeneity that we have to keep in mind those individual factors like perceived burdensomeness, um, community engagement, and things like that as well. Thank you. Thank you. So we have another question for Dr. Watson Singleton. Does the app have feedback from a provider or team to keep the user engaged? So check-ins or check-ups? It does not from healthcare providers, but there are um, people can opt in to receive text message alerts, uh, email alerts to increase engagement. And so people can sort of tailor those. Um, they can, there's a way in which they can use the app to sort of track their progress. Mm -hmm. In the phase two, we're working on additional features such as uh, help, helping people sort of tr track their mood, track their usability to increase just the engagement with the app, especially if they have specific mindfulness goals that they want to meet during, um, during the course of their engagement. One of the things that has come up is, yeah, like how do we use this app in tandem with people's uh, healthcare providers in the event that they want to be able to share their data? And what's interesting is participants have talked about at least wanting to share their results with friends and family so that there could be a friends and family, you know, mindfulness challenge. And participants have also expressed concerns with privacy and security. And so I think it is a balance between how can providers sort of, um, or how can clients use this app with their providers and still sort of balance sort of privacy and data security concerns. Great, thank you. Joya, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry, we have another question for Dr. Kazam. Um, how often are drugs, marijuana use, and alcohol involved in cases which may lead to patients harming themselves? Yeah. So 
interestingly enough, in terms of we look at deaths by suicide, the modal suicide decedent actually doesn't have alcohol in their system at the time of their death, um, or at least it's not like in their blood alcohol kind of content level. So in the majority of cases, alcohol isn't used. And when we think about things like alcohol and drug use, they're not necessarily proximal risk factors for suicide. Certainly some things we want to be keeping aware of um, is there, you know, something else underlying there because these things haven't indicated as risk factors per se, but whether they're actually risk factors for suicide death it appears not necessarily as closely related as we might think. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and there's uh, another kind of question for Dr. Rodriguez Sejas. Uh, you kind of already maybe spoke to this a little bit, but um, one of our uh, Twitter followers asked um, resources that you would recommend to, to students, um, both in kind of like the medical profession and uh, other healthcare providers so that they can learn how to provide better care and resources to kind of overcome the bias, potential bias associated with LGBTQ plus uh, Groups. So the, the, the book I was talking about, it's, it's called The Handbook of Evidence-Based Mental Health Practice with, with Sexual and Gender Minorities. Um, that's the one I was, I think, and that's one I, I kind of go to because it, it does have a lot of different chapters. And that's just one resource. And that's the one I'm most familiar with. That's the one I've used actually the most, possibly because I've worked personally with people who've written in, in some of these book chapters. But there's a lot in there on, um, this is just on treatment for for D DBT treatment, trans diagnostic type of treatments, treatments for eating pathology, treatments for body image disturbances. Um, I think there's a lot of information on many other websites. Um, things like, you know, there's a lot of information through like PFLAG for individuals who are related. And some, a lot of this information kind of overlaps to kind of just understanding the idea of how structural stigma kind of Im impacts mental health and impacts psychosocial dysfunction among sexual and gender minorities. Um, Anecdotally and personally, I suppose, being exposed or maybe trained in this kind of thought process, for me, is much more helpful for any person coming in in front of me to just have that eye out to, well, how could any form of stigma, not just sexual orientation or gender identity, be related to their differential access to different resources or treatment by other people or my own interactions with them? And I think it just beginning to look at that helps you start to understand on the wider range, any patient coming in, well, what are the specifics that might come into play for this one group? Um, so yeah, I, I think there, one also really good place is the AP, APA's, um, it's, not, it's not standards for care, I can't remember the document that they call it, but it's for practice with sexual and gender minorities. And they really do a good job explaining uh, a number of them and the things that psychologists or clinicians need to think about, like uh, understanding the way in which environment shapes um, psychopathology and being able to look at that or appreciate that when we're assessing, treating, and diagnosing patients. I think they do, it's a pretty long document, but it's very well uh, written out, and that's probably a good first place to begin. All information from like, you know, the ABCD SIG, um, sexual and gender minority SIG is a good place as well. They have a lot of information as well, as well as active researchers who do a lot of the research in this area and you can find more of the newest stuff, that, more up-to-date stuff that they're doing uh, currently. So I think those are good places to begin. All right, well, I wanna be mindful of, of everyone's time um, that you devoted today for this uh, this webinar, um, but I wanted to, to see Dr. Walker if you had any other questions or final comments. Um. Yeah, I think, you know, a final comment that I would have, especially in a time such as this, is that I hope that, or I appreciate first, that our presenters affirm the idea that uh, providing services for traditionally marginalized folks isn't about a checkbox. That's the number one question that I think I've gotten and probably many of you is, you know, what is the box that I check to say I have done better as someone who's not a part of a diverse community? Like, what's something I can do? And there's this idea that if I do one good thing, then I have done a good job for the year and I don't have to do anything else. But there is so much work that needs to be done that I hope that individuals will, would take um, a perspective of cultural humility uh, 
and realize that there is so much that I do not know and I need to be personally invested in getting more information, using the, uh, the example as, as the Dr. Rodriguez Sejas you know, shared with us, you know, get self-educated first so that we can be better reviewers, um, you know, so that we can be present or, or um, contribute to a better climate that facilitates getting this work done. Because it's not just about the science for any of us. You know, it's about helping people in these communities who are already struggling. Um, so yeah, so again, applause to you all. And thank you so much for organizing this conversation for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Walker, for your comments. And thank you again to our presenters for sharing your wonderful and really important research. Um, and I think really addressing some topics that are really understudied and don't deserve, aren't receiving the attention that they deserve in clinical science. And I think um, if we're going to address some of the systemic inequalities and disparities, this type of work is needed and uh, needs to be amplified, which was the whole uh, point of this uh, VCL and this original symposium that the SSCP Diversity Committee um, wanted to host. And so again, we just are uh, thankful to, to all of you for being here and thank you to the SSCP board for allowing us to put on this webinar after our symposium was canceled. Um, due to the coronavirus pandemic at the, at the conference at APS. Um, and uh, I encourage all of anybody that ends up listening to this presentation to, to find these presenters on Twitter and social media and interact with them, to find the books and resources that they've published and that they reference and continue the conversation um, afterwards. So thank you again um, to all of you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So